Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I hope everyone is off to a great summer. As always, I want to thank everybody for listening. This podcast has been heard over 15,000 times, and I hope everyone is entertained and learning a lot about Texas history. I also hope you'll tell your friends about the show so we can continue to promote and preserve the history of this great state. Now, a couple of episodes ago, I started a series called Texans You Should Know, and I'm going to do something similar today. Today, I'm going to start a series I'm calling Texas Towns. I'd like to feature the stories of Texas towns past and present and tell some of the interesting stories from the history of those towns. Now, of course, I'll feature big cities in this series, but the word town sounds like more of a Texas word, so I'm going to use it no matter what size community we're talking about. If you'd like to submit a town for the series, please tweet it to at wiseabouttexas or send it to me through the show's Facebook page, or email me at host at wiseabouttexas.com. I picked our first featured town from the last episode. The last episode of Wise About Texas featured a duel between the two men commanding the Texas Army right after the Revolution. One of the participants, Albert Sidney Johnston, was shot in the hip, and he recovered from that wound in the town of Texana. So we're going to start this series with the town of Texana. Besides, shouldn't we start with a town named something like Texana? What a great name for a Texas city. So let's go back to Jackson County in 1832 and get wise about Texas. One of the early doctors in Texas was Dr. Francis Wells. He was born in Virginia and was living in Louisiana when he received a land grant in Austin's colony for a league and a labor of land, which is about 4,600 acres. You'll recall a league of land was a Mexican unit of measurement of about 4,400 acres, and a labor was also a unit of measurement, making up the difference. The grant was located in what is now part of both Brazoria and Jackson counties. Dr. Wells practiced medicine in early Texas. In 1832, he and his sister-in-law, his wife's sister, laid out a town site on the grant about two miles north of the junction of the Lavaca and the Navidad rivers. They named the town Santa Ana after the then well-liked president of Mexico, and the site of the town long before had actually been an Indian village located just northeast of the La Salle's Fort St. Louis, which was one of the earliest, La Salle was one of the earliest explorers to arrive in Texas, and it's almost certain that La Salle visited the site when he was here. The next activity occurred when a man named George Sutherland built a general store. George Sutherland moved to Texas in 1830 from Alabama, Sutherland became active in the several meetings organizing complaints against the Mexican government. Sutherland also got married. He married a lady named Fanny Menifee, who had two brothers, Thomas and William, who were also very active in the pre-Texas Revolution agitation against the Mexican government. Sutherland built a general store in Santa Ana in 1834. He quickly sold it, however, to one of his partners in the store, who was John Menifee. John Menifee was Thomas Menifee's son. The store and that one house, there was one house in town, were apparently the only two structures in the town of Santa Ana for a long time. Now, as I'm prone to do on this show, I want to take a minute and tell you a little side story about John Menifee. Menifee fought at San Jacinto with his former business partner, George Sutherland, And he went on to serve in the legislature in the early Republic of Texas, and he was also a Jackson County official later. But more interesting was his encounter with some Indians. Back in 1840, in response to an incident in San Antonio called the Council House Fight, the largest raiding party of Comanches ever assembled raided all the way from the Llano all the way down to the town of Linville on the coast near Matagorda Bay in Indianola. The Indians looted the town and killed or captured many of the citizens and they stole many of the goods in the town. Then they took off back to the north and to the west. Now, the Texans sent out an alarm, and volunteers came from all over southeast Texas to help and try to meet and fight the Indians. The raid on Linville was August 8, 1840, and the council house fight had been in San Antonio in March of 1840. The day of the Linville raid, John Menifee and about 40 other men from the Texana area were camped and they were under the command of a Captain Clark Owen, and they were camped on the east side of Arenosa Creek, which runs through the present-day Edna, Texas, and old Texana area. On the other side of that Arenosa Creek, near Victoria, was another group of, of Texan volunteers under Captain John Tumlinson. 
Now, Owen sent Menifee and a couple other guys out on a scout, and boy, was that scout successful. What the scouts discovered was actually the main band of the Comanche Raiders coming back from Linville. There were only three scouts. One was caught and killed right there. Another one outran the Indians who chased him. John Menifee, however, was shot seven times with arrows. Now, let me repeat that. He took seven Comanche arrows. Now, if any of you listeners have seen a real Comanche arrow from this time period, it's basically a sharp rock arrowhead with a long wooden shaft. You stick seven of those in you, and you got a problem. Well, Menifee managed to crawl into the brush and evade detection somehow. He spent the night in the brush with seven arrows sticking out of him. He managed to crawl to a nearby ranch and ended up surviving. And word is that he kept those seven arrows in his parlor and loved to tell the tale every chance he got. Now, I know if I'd have been a kid back then, I'd have been over at Old Man Menifee's every single day to hear that story. So he was a tough guy. All right, let's go back to Santa Ana, and we're going back to 1835 and the one store and the one house in town. Now, by 1835, as you might expect, the name Santa Ana was decreasing very rapidly in popularity in Texas. The folks in Texana met in the Menifee store, and they held an election to change the name of the town. The two choices were Pulaski and Texana, and Texana won. And Texana, the town of Texana, continued to grow and prosper as more settlers came to the area. Now, in 1835, the famous uh, Texan Jim Bowie actually visited Texana. Bowie had come from Mexico and was traveling with a guy who became very ill, So he decided to stop at Texana uh, so the guy could recuperate. He wrote a letter, a famous letter from Texana to the capital of the burgeoning Republic, San Felipe, warning everyone that he had just been in Mexico and that Mexico was preparing to suppress the Texas rebellion by force. Now, this was just a few months before Bowie and others would fight in the Battle of Concepcion, which I covered in an earlier episode of Wise About Texas, But Jim Bowie had another adventure in Texana at this time, which resulted in a famous Texas ghost story, and I can't resist. I've got to share it with you. Now, you'll remember that Bowie was married to Ursula Veramendi in San Antonio de Bejar, and Ursula and the Bowie children had died of cholera in Mexico a couple of years before this time when he was in Texana. So while he was in Texana... He fancied a lady named Clara Liesel, and I I think it's pronounced Liesel. It's spelled L-I-S-L-E, and I'm going to pronounce it Liesel. And she fancied him right back. So he showed up for a ball one night in Texana dressed in, you know, this fine Spanish suit, as he would have worn. Reportedly, he gave her a silver necklace that night and promised to return to her as soon as he could. Now, remember... Bowie was also involved in silver mining, trying to locate this lost silver mine. So he gave her a silver chain, and then he rode off towards San Antonio de Bejar. Now, we know from earlier episodes that Bowie and Fannin then led the successful Battle of Concepcion that following October, and they participated in the taking of Bejar that following December. Bowie then went and inspected the Alamo and actually informed the council at San Felipe that he thought it should be defended, and... The rest is history. Well, apparently, Clara Liesel was spending the night of March 6th, 1836. Remember that date? She was spending the night at a friend's house. She woke up in the middle of the night. It was a stormy night, of course, as it always is in these stories. She woke up in the middle of the night and screamed to her friend that she had just had a dream. And her dream was that she heard a horse approaching the house and a man step onto the porch and knock on the door. In her dream, she threw up in the door, exclaiming, Jim, have you returned to me at last? But all she could see was a dark, shrouded figure that stood really still in front of her. She demanded to know who it was, at which point the dark, menacing figure threw open its bony arms and shrieked, Death! Well, Clara told her friend that she was terribly afraid that it was a sign of something. What they didn't know was that mere hours earlier, the Alamo had fallen, and Jim Bowie was killed in his sick bed by Mexican troops. So there's your ghost story for the day. And if it isn't true, well, I think it ought to be. Now back to the daylight. Near Texana in the summer of 1835, the citizens of the town held a meeting called the Lavaca Navidad Meeting. 
and the Menifees were there and the Sutherlands were there. And at that meeting, the folks drafted some resolutions condemning the advancing Mexican troops, the ones Bowie had warned them about. And these were the troops under General Coast that would eventually be defeated in Bejar later that year. The intent of that meeting was to draft some resolutions that could be adopted by other settlements, um, and they were going to keep them secret and circulate them to the other Texian settlements and get everybody to sign off on them, presumably then, I suppose, to present them in some formal way as a majority petition or something. But the battles at Concepcion and Bejar and the convention at Washington on the Brazos made the resolutions unnecessary. The point is that Texana was a very active settlement and a center of commerce and a center of politics, and it was one of the very important centers of the early Texas independence movement. Now, it's important to mention that one of the reasons was that Texana was so successful was that it was a port. During the early revolutionary time period, many of the volunteers for the Texas cause arrived at Texana. James Fannin, the one who was massacred at Goliad, James Fannin landed at Texana, and the Alabama Red Rovers, who would later perish with Fannin and Goliad, camped and trained at Texana. Uh, the Navidad River pr- provided an outlet to the Gulf of Mexico, so it was a significant port. Well, after the Alamo fell, the revolutionary-minded citizens of Texana found themselves basically on the front lines of the advancing Mexican army, so everybody left. They returned after San Jacinto to find the area stripped of all the food and all their livestock. General Urea's army had actually camped at Texana and had destroyed the town on the orders of Santa Ana. So I don't know if uh, maybe Santa Ana had forgotten that the town was originally named after him, or maybe he was mad that they changed the name. But in any event, after Urea left, they destroyed the town. As the citizens left the town, there's one funny story. When they were getting out during the runaway scrape after the fall of the Alamo, the founder's wife, Francis, Dr. Francis Wells's wife, decided to tie the family silver around her waist and take it with her on, as they fled east. And as she tried to get into the raft they were using to escape the Mexican army, she almost capsized it, but apparently made it. No word on whether the silver survived. So if any listeners know... If the Wells Silver survived the Texas Revolution, please let me know. Eventually, the port of Texana was a major one uh, on the Middle Texas coast, and after the Revolution and as the town grew, there were 15 to 20 ships a week stopping at Texana, which would have made it a center of commerce. Now, Texas back in 1836 was a very rough and dangerous place, as we know, but there were always citizens that tried their best to tame the wilder citizens around them. So churches were one of the early ways to build the community in an area. And the first church in Texana was actually a stop on the Methodist circuit as early as 1838. 1838 was the earliest days of the Methodist church in Texas. And in those days, the preachers were called circuit riders because they'd travel from place to place and hold services. And there's a great old quote, and I'm really not sure where this quote originated, but the quote goes something like... uh, an early citizen of Texas saying, quote, when I heard a rustling in the bushes, I knew it was one of three things, an Indian, a bear, or a Methodist circuit rider. And though there were more of the first two, the last was more active, close quote. So I think that's a great quote about the early Methodist preachers. And churches came to Texana early on, and the only, in fact, the only surviving building from the town of Texana today is the Presbyterian Church building, which was built originally in 1859. Well, Texana, in addition to being a port, also had one of the early mail routes in the Republic of Texas. It also had weekly steamboat service, which which was really significant in the way you commuted around if you didn't have a horse. Uh, Texana had a steamboat service, and Indianola had a steamboat service. And before the railroads, that was a really good way to travel. Texana was also on a stagecoach line that ran from Houston to Victoria. It was a stop on that line. And that reminds me, uh, speaking of Houston, that Texana has a very interesting connection with Houston, and that is that it almost was Houston. Let me explain that statement. The Allen brothers, John Kirby Allen and Augustus Allen, bought some land uh, where White Oak Bayou and Buffalo Bayou meet in August 1836, and they built what is now the fourth largest city in the country. But that was not their first choice. Back in early 1836, Augustus Allen decided that the location of Texana would be ideal for an inland port city. 
and he allegedly offered $100,000 in gold. Now, this is 1836, $100,000 in gold for Dr. Wells' league. Well, that would have been several million dollars today, so that was a big price. Well, Wells gave the offer careful consideration and turned around and told Allen that he'd be happy to sell it to him, but the price was going to be 200000 Well, that apparently made Augustus Allen hopping mad, and he jumped up on a stump near the street in the middle of Texana and yelled, quote, Never will this town amount to anything. I curse it. You people listening within the sound of my voice will live to see rabbits and other animals inhabiting its streets, close quote. So I guess Augustus Allen probably ended up right, but not for a good while. Because Texas by, Texana by 1860 was very prosperous. It had a population over 2,000 people. And then, of course, the Civil War loomed. Now, Texana played a role in the Civil War. Company D of the 1st Texas Cavalry had its headquarters at Texana. And that unit had a couple of interesting folks in it, by the way. First, the Pierce brothers were in that unit, Jonathan Pierce and Abel Pierce. Now, you might have heard of Abel. Abel was nicknamed Shanghai, Shanghai Pierce. And we're definitely going to do a Texans You Should Know episode about him very soon. The Pierces were cattlemen, and they had developed a reputation for being good at, and I need to put this gently, um, let's just say acquiring cattle. And so the captain of the unit developed a new uh, executive position of regimental butcher uh, to utilize the Pierce brothers' talent. So no doubt that Confederate unit ate as well or better than any other unit in the Confederate Army. Another unit, Company K of the 2nd Texas Infantry, was actually organized at Texana under the command of Clark Owen. And that name sounds familiar. That was the same Clark Owen we met earlier, commanding the Indian scout against the Comanches. Now this unit, this infantry unit, fought at Shiloh, where former Texana resident General Albert Sidney Johnston, remember he recovered from his wounds at Texana, and he was killed at Shiloh. And that was in the last episode of Wise About Texas, where I made a connection between the wound he suffered in the duel near Texana and his eventual death in the Battle of Shiloh. Now let me tell you about another prominent citizen of Texana, and his name was George Washington Brackenridge. Brackenridge settled in Texana in 1853, coming from Indiana. He became the Jackson County Surveyor right before the Civil War. He was a Unionist, even though he had brothers that served in the Confederate Army. Well, Brackenridge took another direction, discovering that he could make some serious money running cotton down to Mexico and avoiding the federal blockade of the Texas coast. So he went into business with a guy named Charles Stillman, who had a ranch in deep south Texas near the border. And Brackenridge made tens of thousands of dollars running this cotton during the war. Now, the folks of Texana didn't appreciate that, and they denounced him as a, as a war profiteer, uh, which I would imagine had a little less to do with the profiteering part and a little more to do with his unionist sympathies. But nonetheless, they threatened to hang him if he didn't get out of town. So he decided at that time it was a good time to do a little traveling. So he ended up in Washington, D.C., working for the Lincoln administration as a clerk in the Treasury Department. Now, it gets a little interesting here. As a clerk in the tr Treasury Department, Brackenridge was charged with recovering Confederate cotton that was either abandoned or confiscated. Now, cotton was a very valuable commodity back then, remember. So Brackenridge gets himself assigned to, guess where? Brownsville, Texas. So now he's in charge of not only his own cotton, but also everyone else's. Well, of course, he ended up back in business with Stillman. What a coincidence. Now, not to get into too much Civil War history, but many of those Treasury agents from the North were audited and got in some trouble for questionable dealings, but Brackenridge somehow never got an audit. He ended up back in New Orleans toward the end of the war and, interestingly, ended up making about $100,000 or so during his time as a Treasury agent. Very interesting indeed. Well, after the war, Brackenridge could not come back to Jackson County, so he ended up in San Antonio where he founded a successful bank. He actually was a banker for Mifflin Kennedy and Richard King who founded the famous King Ranch. And by the way, those guys ran some cotton up and down the Rio Grande during the Civil War. He also banked Shanghai Pierce, who was one of those regimental butchers in that Confederate unit from Texana. He also lived uh, in a mansion in San Antonio on about 100 acres, much of which eventually became what is now Brackenridge Park in San Antonio. 
Brackenridge was a member of the Board of Regents of the University of Texas for over 25 years. He also, at one point, provided the entire budget for the school when Governor James Paul Ferguson vetoed the budget for the University of Texas. Well, Brackenridge, during his time at the University of Texas, wanted to relocate the UT campus off of the 40 acres and onto some land that he had donated to the university nearby. Another benefactor of the school at that time, a man named George Littlefield, who, by the way, had been an officer in Terry's Texas Ranger, which was a storied Confederate Army unit. Littlefield left the university over $1 million in his will, provided that the campus was not moved. Well, the University of Texas wisely went for the money. The campus, as you know, has not been moved, and I suppose Littlefield won the final battle. Well, Brackenridge died about 1920. He, was di- he actually died in 1920. He was buried in the Brackenridge Family Cemetery in Texana. So he came back home. Well, Texana was going strong into the 1870s, and then along came the railroads to Texas. In 1881, the New York, Mexican, and Texas Railway was coming through Jackson County. The railroad was headed by a count, an Italian count named Joseph Telfener. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's T-E-L-F-E-N-E-R. The Count was married to a lady named Ada Hungerford. His brother-in-law, Telfiner's brother-in-law, named John McKay, was the guy who discovered the Comstock load in Virginia City, Nevada, by the way. The Count wanted $30,000 from the good citizens of Texana to build that railroad right through the middle of town. Well, the citizens of Texana scoffed at that offer for two reasons. First the railroad might impact their shipping business. Now, remember, at this time, railroads were new to Texas. And if you make your money moving goods by water, I doubt you'd want a new way to transport goods coming in. Now, I suppose the line was not intended to move goods from Texana to the interior because that would have been better for the port and would have been a no-brainer. But they said no, and the citizens uh, did not want to speculate on a railroad that they didn't really want anyway. So they turned down his offer. And Texana also was the only town at that point of any size in the area. So I suppose they were thinking that if the old count actually did build his railroad, that he'd have to come through their town. Well, they were wrong. The count got some free land on another land grant just north of Texana. was given by Mrs. Lucy Flournoy, whose grandfather had received the original land grant. He built his railroad a few miles north of Texana, and he built some structures to aid in the railroad construction. He named the station in the settlement Edna in honor of one of his own daughters. Well, Miss Flournoy sp- sprang into action at this point. She laid out a town site. She designated sites for a church. She also built a hotel. And the count came through, and the first train arrived in Edna in 1882. Now, you know railroads were incredibly transformative in this country. We marvel at our smartphones and the cloud computing and all our apps and our technology, but back then... The revolution in transportation that railroads brought was truly remarkable. Well, you can guess what happened next. Folks started moving to the new little town of Edna, Texas. The kiss of death for Texana was that an election was held on a proposition to move the county seat from Texana to Edna in late 1882. The proposition passed by an overwhelming majority, and Edna became the county seat of Jackson County, and the residents began moving to Edna in droves. Houses, churches, buildings, they were all moved a few miles north, and in a few short years, Texana, once a great port in Texas, was finished. In 1968, Congress authorized a dam project on the Navidad, down the Navidad River from the old town site of Texana, and the Palmetto Bend Dam began creating the appropriately named Lake Texana in 1980. Within a couple of years, the old town site of Texana, one of the Republic of Texas's most important ports, was claimed by the water of Lake Texana, where it remains today. Well, now we come to the part of the show called Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places that I mentioned in the episode. And if there's a place I leave out, I hope you'll tweet me uh, at WiseAboutTexas, and I'll figure it out for you. Well, first, Lake Texana is located on State Highway 59 South between Houston and Victoria. The town of Edna is still alive and well, and if you'll go south on 59 to Edna and turn south on Highway 111, 
You will come across Texana Park to the north and the Brackenridge Plantation Recreation Area to the south. That area, that recreation area, is on the shore of Lake Texana. Before you get to the park, FM 3131 goes south of Highway 111, and down that road, where it intersects FM 1822, is the marker for the old town site of Texana. In Brackenridge Park, there off of Highway 111, this is not the Brackenridge Park in San Antonio, but rather the Brackenridge Plantation Recreation Area near Edna, you'll find the Brackenridge Family Cemetery, which is the final resting place of George Washington Brackenridge. John Menifee, the store owner shot with seven arrows from earlier in the episode, is buried in the Menifee Family Cemetery, and it's not clear to me whether he was buried with the arrows he kept for so long or not. Um, and I have not had time to drive down to Edna and see if the Menifee Cemetery is accessible or if it's on private land. But I know that in the cemetery there is a marker for John Menifee as a San Jacinto veteran, and I'll post a picture of that marker that I found. Uh, the Menifee Cemetery is north uh, of the park that I mentioned earlier on the shores of Lake Texana. If anybody knows if that's accessible, please uh, let me know. Leave a comment on the website or tweet me at Wise About Texas. The old Texana Presbyterian Church building was moved to Edna, uh, but has now been moved back to the Brackenridge Plantation Recreation Area, so it stands very close to where it was originally located, and it is one of the last remnants of old Texana. Now, I say one of the last remnants because I want to throw out one more little tidbit that I found interesting about Texana. In 1883, when the county seat was moved to Edna, a casualty of the demise of Texana was the likewise demise of the Masonic Lodge in Texana, which was Texana Lodge 123. Now, some Masons in Austin were discussing the formation of a new lodge when the idea arose to reconstitute the old Texana Lodge. And in 2010, the lodge was reconstituted. So a good a good significant piece of old Texana lives on in Austin, which is, I, I think, a great way to honor one of early Texas's great communities. Well, that wraps up this episode of Wise About Texas. I really appreciate all the opportunities I've had to speak to various groups around the state and share the great stories of Texas history. I hope you will like and share the show's Facebook page and be sure to follow at Wise About Texas on Twitter and on Instagram. If you'd like to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history financially, please go to the show's Patreon page at www.patreon.com, patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. Thank you very much for listening to the show. God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road. <laughs>